There is a beautiful book that was published recently by James A.K. Smith. It is called How to Inhabit Time. The book opens with James talking about the darkest moment in his life. He was suffering from a black depression. He did not know where it came from or why. But he found himself in such despair that he did not know how to keep on living. It was difficult to breathe. He wanted to die. Not knowing what to do, he dragged himself into a counselor's office one afternoon. And thank God, it was a good counselor. James sat on the sofa in that office with no idea what to say, where to begin, or how to even express his despair. So the counselor spoke first. He said, James, I want you to take this piece of paper and pencil and I want you to draw a map of your childhood home. James took the pencil in his hand and as he began to draw, he remembered how in high school he had wanted to be an architect. Memories came flooding back into his mind as the pencil moved across the paper. Remembering the garage where his father repaired snowmobiles. Remembering the steep staircase that led down to the basement room with the wall paneling and the tiny window where James was terrorized by his father. Remembering the blue floral sofa that he and his mother and brother sat on when their father told them that they had to leave. Remembering the two bedrooms on the second floor of that split-level house on Snake Tail Drive. How he and his brother loved their bedrooms, but then after they moved out, how they were erased as the children of his father's mistress moved in. James said that mapping that childhood home, it was like groping in the dark. And gradually, in glimpses, remembering pieces of who he is, and why he struggles. Not understanding everything, not remembering everything, but getting glimpses and orientation of sorts. Piecing together 
his memory and beginning to heal. When human beings try to comprehend the Almighty, we are quite literally groping in the dark. There is no way that the human brain could comprehend the maker of the universe, but we try to find out a little bit, to orient ourselves here and there. We know that we're going to die, that our physical lifespan is limited, but we don't know when and we don't know how. We don't know if it will hurt, if it will be peaceful. There is so much that we don't know. The first humans, we believe, thought of God as many. In multiple cultures all over the planet, generally, human beings thought of there must be a God of the sea because, well, the sea is so unpredictable and we're not controlling it. Maybe someone else was. I mean, there's such a difference between the calm waters and, and the tidal waves. Who does that? There must be a God of the air who could decide between the soft caress of a breeze on your cheek and the violent wind of a tornado. Someone must control that. So there must be a God of the air and a God of the sea and perhaps a God of the mountain. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, our ancestor Abraham was given this revelation that all of these gods were really one, that there was one who created all the world. And this revelation was incredible. It was a huge leap forward in human consciousness. And for thousands of years, and still today, we believe it to be true. But when Jesus came, he opened up for us an even more profound understanding of God than just that God is one. Now, as an Episcopal priest, I'm going to offer my completely biased opinion here. But I would go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with any Hindu, Buddhist, or Hasidic Jew when it comes to our understanding of God. You see, I believe that the concept of the Trinity is the most enlightened, most profound glimpse of the Almighty that exists on the earth. And I believe that if we really could comprehend or even absorb some of the faculties of this mysterious concept of the Trinity that would transform the way human beings interact with one another and with the earth, I believe it is what I would say the least inadequate understanding of God that there is in all of the human race. The concept of the Trinity began when Jesus, in the resurrected form, as we hear in the Gospel of Matthew, he's standing on a mountain in the Galilee. He's about to leave them and he gives them some very specific instructions. He says, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, no one had ever said that before. No one had ever called God by three names. But we know that Jesus had referred to God as Abba, which means Dada or Mama, the first word of a baby 
to love the one that's caring for and providing for that child. We know that Jesus used that intimate word to refer to God. And we know that by this time the disciples were beginning to comprehend that Jesus too was also God. And we know that Jesus had already spoken to them at the Last Supper about giving them a spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Paraclete, all these names he used for some mysterious presence that would remain with them after he left. But this was the first time that Jesus had used all three words together. Three in one. One in three, and it makes absolutely no sense at all. And that, my friends, may be the most important point of all. The Trinity makes no sense if you try to make sense of it by saying, oh, it's like water, which is like ice and liquid and gas. You're creating a heresy. I think that one's called modalism. If you try to understand the Trinity with your rational mind, it cannot be done. And that's the point. It's to remind us that we cannot intellectually wrap our minds around God. When we try to do so, if we get our minds around whatever it is we think is God, it's not God. We've made it too small. I want to give you three primary perspectives on the Trinity, three things that are amazingly important if we are to learn more about ourselves, if we are to grope in the dark trying to find our way to God. The first is this, God is not lonely, God is not alone, God has all community and all love within the divine self. You were not made because God wanted company. God already had company. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in an eternal dance of community. And when it says that we are made in the image of God, it doesn't mean you as an individual or me as an individual. It means us together. The image of God is community. It is when we are together that we reflect God's nature. And it is not good for us to be alone. And so if we are to find God, we must find people. We must walk with other disciples. Jesus walked with disciples and women the whole of his ministry do not do this alone. You cannot find God by yourself. We need one another. The second point is that within God there is all kinds of diversity. Do you think Father and Son and Holy Spirit are anything alike? They are totally, completely different from one another. And we as human beings limit ourselves if we don't expose ourselves to diversity all the time. There is a book by Christina Cleveland called Disunity in Christ. She talks about how it is human nature to want to hang out with people that look and think just like you. And when you hang out with people that look and think just like you, you think that they all are very complicated and very diverse. Like I think, well, women in their 50s, white women in their 50s, we're so different from one another. Some are fat, some are thin, some are progressive, some are conservative. But when I think about the Japanese culture, I think they're all the same. That's human nature. And if we don't break out of the group that link, looks and thinks like us, we limit our understanding of ourselves and of God. 
One of the greatest gifts of this cathedral is our diversity. Amen? Amen. If you want to know God, you go out and you find someone, maybe someone who is physically disabled, if you're not, and you ask them what their life is like, and you listen. You go out and you find someone who believes that they are a different gender from the one that they were born with, and you talk to them about what that is like, what it's like to live that way, what it's like to become fully the person they believe themselves to be. You find another culture from another part of the world. You find someone who's from somewhere far away, and you ask them, what is their life like? What was it like to grow up in their world? And every time we expose ourselves to people who think and look differently from us, we learn not only about ourselves, but we reflect the image of God because God is diverse and magnificent and beautiful. And lastly, and this is the hardest one of all, God is change. The number three is always out of balance with itself. It is always moving and dancing learning and growing. And I don't know about you, but I don't always want to change. My son Max just graduated from high school, and a couple days ago I saw a picture of him in third grade looking so cute in his little uniform, and I started to cry because I don't really want him to change. I liked him like that. Why does he have to grow up? I, I love him as a young man, but I, he was so cute. Part of us wants to hold on to things. We want them to stay the way that they are, especially when we like them. We want the, our house to look the same. We want our worship to be just the same. We just want routine. But I'm sorry, God is change. Life is change. And to be fully alive means to lean into that change, to live in the present moment, to allow things to develop to allow our minds to be expanded, to always be thinking that we don't know enough, that there's more we need to learn. It's terribly uncomfortable and can be terrifying, but we reflect the image of God when we embrace change. There is a reason why the church dedicates an entire Sunday to this concept of God because we are groping in the dark, trying to understand one who is so much more vast and complex and all-encompassing than we could ever comprehend. But there will be times when you will catch glimpses, glimpses of such beauty, flashes of understanding that you never thought you could get. reverence for something so much bigger than we will ever understand. The three, the one, the incomprehensible, the remarkable trinity of God. Amen.